Uh, my name is uh, Ahmad Ibrahim, I'm associate professor at University of Idaho, and I will be the moderator for, uh, for that session here. Uh, so we have uh, four presentations today, and uh, each presenter will just have about 15 minutes uh, presentation followed by uh, two to three minutes of questions uh, to be on time. Um, so uh, the first presenter here is Dr. Uh, Jia Li, and he is an assistant professor at uh, Washington State University in the civil and environmental engineering. And uh, his research uh, focuses on uh, automated transportation systems, uh, modeling, uh, operations, and optimization. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Lee, uh, the floor for you is, is yours now. You can just go ahead. So, uh, Thank you uh, for the introduction, and uh, it's my honor here to present my research. And uh, today my uh, topic is on the mixed autonomy traffic uh, towards understanding the collective rationality. So uh, nowadays there are a lot of uh, high anticipations about the self-driving and the automated vehicle uh, technology, so uh, I will not repeat uh, those background here. Uh, but the research question that I'm trying to answer uh, in this talk is what are the collective behaviors of self-interested traffic agents uh, in the mixed autonomy traffic flow? And uh, there are two uh, emphasis of this research. Uh, first is the consideration of the collective behavior uh, of traffic. And the reason is that uh, the collective behavior matters to the system performance. And also, we have a lot of traffic control measures that are uh, aimed at regulate the traffic at a macroscopic level. Uh, and uh, such zoom out view of the collective uh, behavior of uh, uh, mixed autonomy traffic is also uh, missing in the literature. And uh, the reason to consider the self-interestedness uh, is because uh, we know that automated vehicles can be controlled uh, uh, very well. We can design very sophisticated algorithms uh, to optimize, for example, the trajectory, the platooning of the automated vehicles. However, this assumes that automated vehicle will follow the order from the system. And uh, by considering the self-interestedness, uh, we do not uh, have this assumption. Rather, we consider the automated vehicle behave on their own and they try to optimize their own objective. And uh, we are interested in how the mixed flow will behave in this situation. And uh, here I want to uh, show you two, uh, two real world examples uh, to illustrate uh, how the mixed flow can behave in the real world. So in one of the example, You can see that uh, even though the intersection, uh, there is no signal control here, but different road users seem to coordinate very well with each other. They have some uh, uh, coordination with each other, even though uh, such coordination doesn't uh, explicitly exist. And uh, on the other hand, this is another popular video from the YouTube. You can see this is on the rural road, and if you often drive, uh, drive on the rural road, you, you may encounter such a situation. And this is called uh, left lane hogs. So the point here is that when we consider the traffic flow, uh, their behaviors can differ very much. So we can sometimes anticipate the coordin uh, coordination occurs in the traffic, but sometimes it seems the drivers just behave very badly. And my research is trying to answer, when we consider the different traffic agents, when will the cooperation happen and when uh, uh, it will not? So uh, the very basic idea of, uh, uh, of my model is very uh, simple. Let's consider that Tom and Jerry, they are fighting uh, for, for a piece of cheese. And uh, they cannot reach an agreement with each other. So now I design a rule saying that each of you will, uh, will propose a number. And if the total is below one, then you get the number you propose. And if the total number is larger than one, then you will get nothing. So you can think about in this case, what will be their strategies, right? And what 
the equilibrium that uh, they will reach. And uh, that's the so-called Nash equilibrium uh, in the game theory uh, language. So in, the, in one case, if they are very greedy, each propose one is their number, then each of them will get zero by the rule. And uh, this is indeed a Nash equilibrium. And uh, if we consider another scenario, they are not so greedy this time, 0.3 and 0.3, they will get that. But you can see the problem here is that there are still some remaining cheeses that they do not get. And uh, we can also see other scenarios. The third and the fourth cases, they split the cheese completely. So they are, uh, they are satisfied, uh, satisfied in these cases. So this illustrates a very basic idea. Our roadway is like the pieces of, uh, is that, is like the piece of cheese. And the different road, road users are competing for this roadway capacity. So this is a very basic insight, <coughs> insight in, uh, in my model. And uh, in the mixed autonomy context, there are some challenges to address. And uh, the first one is that we know that in the case of, uh, of Tom and Jerry, I design the rule of the game. But in the traffic flow, no one designed the rule. Rather, the traffic agents follow the physics. So the game theory is not used uh, to regulate the behavior, but rather to capture the physics. And another point uh, is the traffic agents behave more sophisticatedly than Tom and Jerry. They have their own driving uh, dynamics. For example, the speed, uh, speed function is nonlinear, and uh, they are sensitive uh, to their leading vehicles. And there are also the randomness and the longitudinal and the lateral uh, interactions to address. So these are the major complications to address when we introduce the game theory to model the, uh, the, uh, the interactions between the, uh, the human drivers and the automated vehicles. So I will not go through all the details here, but the very basic idea is for the game theory model, we need a payoff function to capture the interaction. So here, uh, the different uh, form of the road configuration represent the equilibrium they potentially can reach. So based on this type of equilibriums, I have the payoff function uh, at the lower right corner. So this capture two situations. In one of the situation that uh, in the first case that represent the two classes of traffic can reach agreement, meaning that they can split the road uh, uh, to two portions and each one class take one, uh, one of the portion. And in the second uh, case, they cannot reach agreement. So the traffic flow in this case will be fully mixed. So it's kind of uh, the chaotic case. So uh, based on uh, this uh, game theory model, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, derive the, uh, the equilibrium the model. But before doing that, we need to uh, further incorporate uh, the physics of the traffic agents. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, in, the, uh, in the first case, I need to consider the so-called one pep equilibrium speed meaning that the traffic agents are fully mixed with each other. And uh, in that case, I uh, approximate uh, the distribution of the traffic agents uh, using the uh, random sampling. And I come up uh, with an equilibrium uh, speed function at the lower right corner. So, uh, so after some, uh, some mathematics, it's uh, pretty tedious. Uh, we can reach uh, to the major conclusion of the paper. Uh, that is, when we consider the equilibrium, uh, when the equilibrium will be Pareto efficient, the Pareto efficiency means uh, no player can benefit uh, himself by do not do harming to the other part. And uh, this is regarded as a good equilibrium in the traffic. And the recall the example at the beginning of this uh, talk, it corresponds uh, to the coordination between the different drivers and the road users. And the collective rationality means the 
regime when the driver can reach the Pareto efficiency. And the, the key takeaway uh, for this model is that when we consider the mixed flow at different uh, density levels, in some regimes, uh, drivers simply cannot reach the Pareto efficient equilibrium. So that means uh, whatever control you impose, uh, you will not help the, uh, the driver to reach a better state. Uh, but in the other regime, uh, the Pareto efficiency, uh, efficient natural equilibrium is one of the equilibrium. And uh, in that case, uh, the control will play a role to uh, improve uh, the traffic flow. So, uh, uh, so another uh, concept here is uh, when the good equilibrium can be reached, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a benefit generated by the cooperation, and that's called the surplus of cooperation. And the, the intuitive interpretation of that is when the agents are willing to cooperate, there is a certain amount of road capacity that will be resulted from the cooperation. And the, this is the surplus. And the, this surplus can be redistributed to the different classes of, uh, of agents. And the, that's the basis for, uh, for designing different uh, control policies. And here I uh, give an example uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this formula. So let me uh, show you example, uh, some example of uh, the application of the model. So the first application is that when I specify the agent behaviors, I can get the macroscopic equilibrium of the traffic. And uh, if you recall the, uh, the traffic engineering uh, class uh, that you possibly take uh, in, the, uh, in your undergrad, uh, you know that the relationship such as the flow density is very fundamental. That tells you a lot of information about how the traffic behave. And uh, this is the counterpart of that relationship. And uh, in the second example, it's more interesting that I consider a lane policy. And uh, when the two class of uh, agents behave rationally, what will happen? So the more, uh, I show that uh, depending on how the interaction of the human driver and the automated vehicle are designed, we possibly see a sudden transition here when we increase the automated vehicle demand in the system. And the interesting implication of that is the mixed autonomy system, if there is no, uh, uh, if there is, uh, no careful consideration, uh, uh, there is possibly some harm to the other class of road user, and that results in the uh, equity issue uh, in the system. So, uh, so next, I will talk very briefly about some empirical evidence uh, and the uh, identification uh, based on the theory part. So the question we want to ask is that, uh, okay, we have a game theory model, but how do you tell that your model approximate the reality well? And the, the key observation here is that the game theory model can <coughs> make the macroscopic prediction based on the agent behavior. And then now we have a lot of traffic data that give you the trajectory level details and that tells you the agent level behavior and, uh, as well as the macroscopic behavior. So this is the idea underlying the framework that I show here. We just want to identify the parameter that give the best match between the two predictions. And the, the figure on the left uh, show you the surplus value that I just talked about. And uh, we see it seems there is some good pattern from the data. It's not looking like random. So this is a good evidence that the game theory may be a good tool to provide some first approximation to the behavior and understand collective effect of, the, uh, uh, of their behaviors. And the, on the right hand side, right -hand side uh, is the split factor identified from the data. So it's some value between zero and one. And based on the model, it means there is some level of cooperation uh, between the two classes of drivers. Meaning that even though there isn't explicitly control of their behavior, human drivers are somehow intrinsically uh, cooperating uh, with each other. 
So uh, that's about the research. And uh, the question that uh, at the end of the day is we want to know in mixed flow whether the agents are competing with each other or uh, cooperating with each other, if they are all self-interested. And uh, the short answer is it depends. Uh, they can uh, cooperate or not. And it depends on the system uh, uh, state. And uh, here is a, a quick uh, illustration of uh, some of my other uh, research. Uh, basically, I, uh, I leverage uh, the agent uh, level modeling as well as the data science to tackle uh, problems centered on transportation. So on one hand, it's the mixed autonomy. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm interested in uh, looking at the problem in the broader uh, built uh, environment context. And uh, here is also uh, some recent work uh, on, the, on the safety. And uh, I will not go uh, very detail into that. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any question, I'm very happy to answer that. Okay, so the second presenter here is, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, just, uh, you good? good? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the second presenter is Alan <coughs> Zeland, which, uh, who is actually an uh, uh, ITS and uh, CV leader at uh, DKS uh, Associates, and more than 45 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> More than 45 years of experience, and uh, I'm, uh, for the sake of time, I'll just, uh, I know uh, Alan is an expert in, the, again, uh, CAVE, but I will just uh, let him start because I think we have very limited time here. Yes. So, thank you. We'll move right. on. Okay, thanks very much, Ahmed. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, so, I'm going to look at um, something that, that um, less theoretical than the presenta excellent presentation we just did. Um, looking at connected and uh, autonomous ve um, vehicles from the infrastructure standpoint now, um, focusing upon the infrastructure. Um, do we have a timer going? Uh, I'll just set up my own timer if that's okay. So I know where we are with this. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, so just, just to make sure we're all on the same page as to um, what we're talking about with connected vehicles here. Um, there are various ways that the information can be received by a vehicle, uh, the way we currently look at um, connected vehicle communications. Um, and the first one, of course, is the, is the, oops, go back here, is the um, operational boundary one, which is um, we see in automated vehicles right now, uh, where you get blind spot warning, um, collision warning, that sort of thing. Um, tends to be short distance, of course, um, centered around the vehicle. Um, this is operational boundary two, which is a little bit broader, and this is where information coming, f the easiest to think of is um, traffic signals, for example, giving the infrastructure, giving information to vehicles to do red light violation, warning, pedestrian and crossing ahead, that kind of uh, feature. That's on operational boundary two. And then we've got operational boundary three, which is network-based, um, and we get this already. If you use Waze, if you use Google, this being your, you're being fed as the driver, uh, real-time information, um, and it, it could be miles and miles and miles away from you. So three very distinctive operational boundaries that we have um, to deal with here. Within the CV architecture itself, you see these through the V2I is vehicle to infrastructure. That's at operational boundary two there we were talking about. And then the operational boundary three, uh, through the network, um, typically we think of cellular communications there, and the ability to reach all types of road users, in not only vehicles, but also pedestrians as well, because we've got 300 million of these things around to use as well, and we can make use of them. And we'll be talking about that a little bit later. In terms of technology, communications technology, 
Of course, we've, we had the battle, the wars between, um, for direct communications. This is the uh, V2I stuff. Um, and DSRC, dedicated short range communications, the FCC, they've ruled that out now and said we're going to move to CV2X, um, but we can't move to CV2X because they're not giving any waivers or any licenses to be able to deploy this equipment. So we have a standoff there. But if we move to CV2X, um, there's short range communications, the PC5 protocol, and the network, UU is the over the cellular. Um, and an important point to note with this, um, with the, the, the CV2X um, and network, they're both supported, both network and direct are supported within the CV2X protocol there. But the spectrum that's been allocated to CV2X is only 30 megahertz out of the original 75 megahertz that was dedicated to DSRC. So there's a big debate going on as to how that can be used and is it sufficient. Um, the CAT coalition, um, which was a um, combination of um, OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, and infrastructure owners and operators, so infrastructure and vehicle, came out with an architecture. Um, and within this architecture for uh, connected vehicles, it is a cooperative, cooperative automation and transportation. Um, you'll see how the network aspect fits into this. Um, so throughout this architecture, starting off with the network interfaces to, for example, traffic signal controllers in, in, the, in the street, backhaul back to central system, central system connectivity into the internet, um, and the ability to actually then pass information through the cellular network down to the various road users here. And an important aspect we'll come back to is the data sharing, um, the sharing of the data that gradually becomes accessible through the internet. Who's doing this? You know, this is all nice in theory, but who's actually doing it? Well, of course, we've had the, um, the connected vehicle pilot projects funded by US DOT, and of course, we've got millions of vehicles, haven't we, in the US that now have connected? No, we don't. We've got like 3,000 in New York, big deal. Um, and the other connected vehicle pilots, the small fleets of the agencies. It's just not happened. But in parallel with the, um, the US DOT funding, industry stepped up the plate as it normally does. And I give you an example from a company that I used to work with, Applied Information, who came out with this approach. They started off with um, putting a cabinet unit into existing equipment in the street, traffic signal controllers, um, uh, variable message signs, to monitor the equipment to help with operations and maintenance. But then they found that they were um, extracting information that made available um, over, the, um, over the cloud through a cloud-based application called Glance to the agencies to maintain the equipment um, through web-based access. Um, but the data that they were collecting here um, in the interface between the, their cabinet interface unit and the agency field device was the data that's needed for connected vehicle applications. So what they did, they took this a step further, and um, that's the equ equipment that they install, and you can see it going in, interfacing with traffic signals and speed, very, uh, speed message signs, school signs, taking this information up into the uh, application in the cloud, and feeding it through, um, through the network to these various users. In the vehicle, it's not because there aren't any units in the vehicles. Um, it's going to the driver either through the smartphone, or if you've got something like CarPlay, it goes straight onto the, to the dashboard and you get the messaging on your dashboard as you would um, other messages. So this was all happening about four or five years ago. Um, that applied information started doing this, and they're still doing it now. Um, but at the time, um, I got talking to, to the, uh, the researchers at PATH, University of California, Berkeley, um, and they were intrigued as to the, um, what the limitations were of this network-based communications. And we're talking about 4G now, not 5, 4G, because this is like research from three years ago now. Um, so they used the Camino Real testbed, Caltrans's testbed in, um, in, in California, 
Um, and they did a comparison of latency. And what they found was 95% of the time, DSRC, the latency, this is from the equipment producing the data to it getting to the vehicle, 18 milliseconds. Over the network, it was 100 milliseconds. So you see the, the time difference there. 98% of the time, 20 milliseconds and 200. And then 99.99% of the time, the latency over the cellular network um, was, could be up to two seconds, okay? So it makes you worry, wonder about the safety situation here. Um, so they came to the conclusion, again, three years ago, 5.9 gigahertz band, that's that band I was talking about, that's the 75 megahertz uh, for DSRC, um, was critical for safety applications that required reliable and short communication latency. An existing 4G could support mobility applications, okay? So there's a, they identified that differentiation there. We move now to two years ago, and the connected intersection activity led by ITE with USDOT actually went back to look at the equipment that was installed by agencies under the connected vehicle pilots. And if you look at the SPAT messaging, signal phase and timing coming out of the traffic signal controller, going to the RSU and, uh, to, for red light violation warning and that sort of thing, that's every 100 milliseconds. It's a 10 hertz cycle, nominally, nominally. Because what they found with the equipment installed was, you'll see on the 100 milliseconds line there, that's the majority of transmissions are 100 milliseconds. But look how many go up to 200 milliseconds. So you're now putting the short range communication in the same latency band, that mid band, as over the network. And again, this is 4G. This is not 5G, this is 4G. This testing continued. Um, and in M City, then Michigan, um, Verizon, and Honda. And we do have a Verizon representative uh, here today um, who can answer a lot of questions about this if necessary. Um, they look at issuing alerts for emergency vehicles pet in the crosswalk, uh, very important safety at, um, application, and collision avoidance with uh, vulnerable road users. Verizon worked with Cisco on this test bed, and they found the SPAT and MAP latency over the cellular network 33 to 62 milliseconds. So we're now seeing, even with 4G, we're now seeing um, through improvements in the communication equipment, we're seeing that the short range and the network are equivalent latencies. Future, further research was carried on by FHWA and they came up with a maximum of 70 milliseconds. So they verified this. Okay. So What's been happening then to take advantage of this distribution of data and support of connected vehicle applications um, through, through the network? And my stopwatch is, is gone, sorry. Um, so I'm going to give you some examples of cloud-based applications. You can see where this is going and round off with um, where, uh, the, where the, the state of the art is really. Um, um, and it's not in the United States. Great example is uh, Oregon DOT. Um, after they carried out the uh, road user charging pilot, the RUC, um, they took a step back and said, how would we implement road user charging, because it was successful, um, within the state of Oregon? Um, and they took a broad view and said, well, this is the connected vehicle application. So let's build an architecture that accommodates not only RUC, but also accommodates connected vehicle applications and we get the safety benefits and all the other mobility benefits as well. Um, I'm pleased to say DKS was involved um, with developing this, the design for this and the ecosystem, the CVE connected vehicle ecosystem. Um, it went out to bid and I understand that um, an award will be announced um, before the end of the year uh, for the team that will go ahead and start building this. So that's going on now. Another project that DKS is involved with, a couple actually, and next gen transit signal priority. 
Um, it used to be the transit signal priority along with emergency vehicle preemption depended upon special equipment in the vehicle talking with the radio to the traffic signal controller, um, a receiver in the street there to say, right, this is when I'm arriving um, and you know, I'm going to request priority. What happens now is the latest design is to make use of communications on the bus that are already there because buses are communi communicating the transit management systems to tell them I'm behind schedule, confirm what their schedule is, how many passengers do I have on board. This information goes up into the cloud and there the request for priority is determined as to whether it should be granted depending on how far behind schedule it is and comparing it with maybe other services that conflict at an intersection. If it's decided that the, uh, the, the decision to grant priority is yes, that goes across through the cloud straight into the traffic management center and the request is made down to the intersection. No extra equipment in the street, no extra equipment on the bus because it's already there to transmit this information. And now we're seeing um, um, this was designed originally for Metro in LA and the first installation of it, of this type of system uh, was in Portland um, and the buses are running there now as of last month um, with this. Very easy to deploy and scale. And then finally, where are we heading with this? You'll be aware, and we've got, we've got a company out outside their AI um, with, with all this wonderful new sensing equipment and you'll hear about LiDAR and all this sort of thing. More equipment going in the street to improve the quality of the data that we're getting, to improve the insights that we get for better operations. Um, Verizon recognized this and so has Intel. Um, and they say that um, rather than have to rely on more and more and more data going over the communications network, um, do edge computing, do the analytics out there at the point of collecting the data and then you can be much more efficient um, with transferring data up into the cloud for further analytics um, and you get faster communications because you, you're having to transmit less data. And you can still service the traffic management systems locally if you need to through existing communications or you can share data over the cloud. And this is the mobile edge computing um, that Verizon used the term um, with a virtual RSU. So instead of having the roadside unit, there's a virtual RSU up in the cloud that collects, for example, SPAT data directly from the intersection controllers um, over the network. So this is technology that's there, ready to go. And I don't know if any, were, any one of you were in, in the World Congress, but on the Intel booth, um, they were showing all the different applications that have been developed using their architecture for mobile edge computing. And it's quite a range of applications from a range of companies there. So I'm going to talk about some very concrete um, experience that have been had looking at this broader approach of, um, of use of network technology. Now in the Netherlands, about four or five years ago, Remember about the time that applied information started doing this cloud-based stuff. And the, the Dutch deployed a large project um, which had both the SRC type equipment in, short-range communications, but also network-based communications. And they had all this installed and running and testing the different CEV applications, uh, red light violation warning, um, speed advisories, all this sort of thing together with mobility ones. They took a step back from it when they collected all the data and they said, it's obvious, so you've got to go network. Because the RSU's based solutions of equipment in the street is so difficult to scale. This is a much smaller country than the US, remember? They said it's just, it's not practical to scale, we are going network based. And they came out with a new project called Talking Traffic. Um, with a whole range of use cases, and you'll see uh, mobility use cases and safety use of cases, here, time to green, um, for example, um, road hazards, priority, um, all these applications supported by this network. And this was the network they came out with. Um, 
On the left, you see the infrastructure side of traffic signal systems um, with the traffic management systems collecting the data, feeding it into the cloud with multiple mobile network operators and cloud applications. The whole idea was this is not exclusive to one company. It has to be an open environment. Um, and it feeds um, a whole range of users. You see emergency services there. And the OEMs get involved in it for collecting data from their vehicles and sharing that data, um, as well as having the exclusive data for their own use. And going through on the right-hand side, top right-hand corner, smartphone apps. Smartphone apps to get the data down into the car so they can get benefits from this technology now. And the OEMs have been coming along with this, as we'll see, um, but their main push was get it out to the, the public now so we get the safety benefits now. So these were the lessons they learned from the original project and also the, the final um, operational deployment. It works, latency is never an issue. Latency was never an issue. It was challenging to integrate on the application level because you have different applications, um, but if you came out with good quality functional specifications and good data quality, that merged together to make it easier. It was very cost effective. Managing privacy, security, and liability, no problem at all using existing techniques on communications network. Quickly deployed and scaled up in terms of coverage and reach. It was quickly adopted by consumers, as we'll see. Proven business models. There have got to be business models behind this stuff, you know, um, to make this thing work. That's what we see in communications um, all sorts of applications, not in transportation, but all sorts of other applications, the business models come through to support them. Um, easily extensible in terms of use cases, complements ADAS, the Automated Driver Assist Systems. And it does not require what they call an organizational big bang on the public side. Easy to do. So where are they? They've got 1,300 intersections connected. You say, well, that's not very many. It's actually... 25% of the intersections in the Netherlands are connected now. Think about that, 25%. Um, all the regions and all within the, the Netherlands, and they, they have the different highway agencies, just as we do here. You see the live use cases examples here. Um, they're all connected. Two million connected road users. Two million connected road users. And they do a billion messages per day. And they haven't stopped there. This has been adopted in Belgium, Finland. Next goes into Sweden. The UK is looking at it as well. Um, the, the, there's a range of, of suppliers. You see firms that you know here, Swarco, Unix, Siemens, um, all working together, sharing information. This equipment all works together. And... Um, the exchange, a whole range of, 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 of um, sorry, a whole range of, of data there. So the lessons that we've learned I wanted to get across here is, you know, we started off looking at two solutions, local and cloud, and there was all this debate about which to use. There's no debate anymore. See, cellular V2X won the connection wars, and it's not or, it's and. It's both. Consider both. There will be instances when maybe network communications can't be used, rural areas, um, that you can move to the infrastructure based. Um, but if you look at the, the impact that the network based communications can have, especially on the safety side, especially in the terrible situation we are now with the, we've gone back how many years in terms of fatalities? We're worse than it has been for the last six years. We've got to tackle this problem. And it's been proven by these operational systems in Europe that we can do it with network-based uh, connected vehicle applications. And if Europe can do it across um, national boundaries like Finland, Sweden, and the Netherlands, you know, I think we can do it across state-bound borders here if we take this approach. And we can forget the FCC. We don't need this for, to do this. We don't need decisions on, on the, the spectrum. It's already there for us to use within the cellular network. There are millions of mobile devices now in, that are now in use and can be uh, utilized by, um, by drivers and vulnerable road users as well. And then finally, just a quick look at that data sharing. 
Um, and this is where the research needs come in. So um, we need data sharing between the cloud-based applications. And how do we build on the WorkZone data exchange? Is that a possibility? Um, because that's turning into a great success story of agencies working together um, and use it as a generalized data exchange for CEV. However, just this week, it was announced that the US DOT ITS Joint Program Office is starting a new next-gen traffic management data dictionary, TMDD activity. And the goal is to develop and publish a data standard to collect, manage, and distribute near real-time transportation data among IOOs, infrastructure owners and operators, data aggregators, including non-IOOs, and the traveling public, including the automotive sector. It sounds like a solution to this problem to me, to be quite honest. We need to look at business models and agree that with between, between agencies and industry. Um, and maybe we need a governing entity to ensure safe and fair operations. And we're looking at that under another um, federal highway project right now for digital infrastructure. Thank you very, very much. My apologies for running. So w w one question. <laughs> Here. <clears throat> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for mobility application, I fully understand the move to uh, a wireless network and a cloud-based network right. to reach all users that use a cell phone. Um, but for safety applications, um, how do you see this applicable to the U.S. where we have about 85 to 90 percent of our rural roads who has the highest fatalities with no cell coverage, with no communication coverage at all? Well, um, the, the question was, um, how do you apply this approach to rural roads um, where there's as high fatalities? Um, and could you quote an 85% of all fatalities are on rural roads? No, I don't I mean, think so. 85% of the rural roads do not have any type Never of coverage. So. Oh, coverage. yes. Yeah, well, that is an issue. Yeah, I mean, that is an issue to be addressed. Um, and I did say that it's not, it's not either direct or network. You have to use them both together. And there will be areas where you have to put in infrastructure um, to deal with specific um, safety problems. And I know from my experience that how many states where the worst intersections are rural intersections in terms of the highest fatality rates. But then you can focus on those and, and use the, the short range communications for them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we don't have I need to move on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the next. Uh, Next presenter is Dr. Mustafa Asfour, who is a visiting professor at University of Idaho. And uh, he is an associate professor at the uh, MTC, right? yeah. the Military Technical College in Egypt. And I think the floor is yours, Dr. Asfour, or is that? Okay, almost uh, afternoon. Uh, so I'm uh, Dr. Mustafa Asfour from, uh, from the University of Idaho. I'm an associate professor at the Military Technical College in Egypt. Uh, we're talking about the uh, electromobility takeoff, the opportunities and the challenges. Actually, I'm going, I'm going to uh, talk up through, go through the 2022 electric vehicle uh, outlook report, which is uh, gathered or done by the International Agency uh, Energy Agency. Uh, so, uh, the current opportunity to transform uh, the way we uh, move uh, fundamentally results from uh, the changes in three main areas. So the uh, regulations which comes from the governments and cities that have introduced uh, regulations and incentives to accelerate uh, 
uh, uh, the shift to the sustainable uh, mobility. Actually, regulators worldwide are defining uh, more firm emission targets uh, which seek to align climate energy and land use and transport and taxation policies to reduce net greenhouse uh, uh, emissions by at least 55% by 2030. Also, cities are working to reduce um, private vehicle use by offering greater support for uh, alternative mobility models like bicycles. And the second is the uh, consumer behavior, which, which is changing as more people accept alternative and sustainable mobility modes. In fact, inner city uh, trips with standard bicycles and e-mobility -mo and e-scooters have risen like 60% over year, uh, year over year. In addition, uh, consumers are becoming more open to shared mobility options. Finally, the technology where the industry players are accelerating the speed of automotive uh, technology innovations as they develop new concepts for electric, connected, and autonomous and shared mobility. Such electric technology innovations will help reduce electric vehicle costs and make electric shared mobility a real alternative to owning a car. Uh, so the 2020, what is the today's picture? Uh, 2021 sales picture show that electric vehicle markets are expanding quickly. Um, and global share uh, sales have kept rising as strongly actually during the uh, first quarter of 2022 with 2 million electric vehicles sold. Uh, sales of electric vehicles doubled in 2021 uh, from the previous year uh, to a new record of 6.6 .6 million electric cars. Uh, back in 2012, actually just, just 120k electric cars were sold worldwide. Uh, nearly 9% of the global car sales were electric in 2021, four times actually uh, the market share in 2019. Uh, the increase in electric vehicle sales in 2021 was, was led by China, which ac accounted for half of the growth, and sales in Europe and US actually um, raised after the 2020 boom. Um, the total number of electric cars on the world uh, roads is um, like 16.5 million uh, in 2021, which is triple the amount in 2018. The success of electric vehicles uh, is being driven by multiple factors. Actually, su sustained policy support in, is the main pillar and uh, improvements in battery technology more charging infrastructure, and thanks, thanks to Alan, which explored the uh, details of the uh, infrastructure for connected vehicles, um, and uh, actually no compelling models from the automakers. Uh, electrification is spreading to all segments of road transport, setting a stage for huge changes ahead. Uh, we all know about the benefits of electromobility, where electric-powered transport has become one of the main drivers worldwide to mitigate our impact on the environment and to mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, the, the use, actually, of electric vehicles help reduce emissions, improve air quality, and therefore lead to decrease in respiratory, visual, and cardiovascular diseases, in addition to eliminating noise pollution as well. Uh, electric vehicle costs uh, more than a, uh, more than a comparable, a comparable uh, gasoline or diesel vehicle, uh, mainly due to the large cost of the production or, or the production of uh, the battery. Although this price uh, have fallen in the past years, however, electricity is cheaper than fuel, uh, fossil fuels. Um, Electric vehicles um, actually require less maintenance and fewer repairs, uh, therefore no need for oil or filter change, and there are no exhaust system, timing belts or V-belts, uh, and the actually combustion engine uh, has around 250 or uh, 200, uh, 2,500 components to produce and uh, assemble. Uh, compared with just 250 for an electric motor. Uh, 
th this chart actually uh, gives an insight on the status and evolution of electric vehicle model availability through the period of tw uh, 2015 through 2021. Uh, where, meanwhile, the, the, the many car makers have plans to electrify their fleets uh, that go further the, uh, than the uh, policy targets. Recently, five times uh, more new electric vehicle models were available in 2021 than in 2015. The number of electric vehicle models available on the market uh, globally is around 450, uh, with particular expansion in SUVs. Uh, in 2022, and beyond, expectations are far more even electric vehicle models, especially SUVs to reach market uh, as automakers accelerate effort to electrify this fast growing segment. So the, the, uh, this charge, the chart on the left uh, shows a significant increase in the number of available electric vehicles uh, models available relative to the uh, electric vehicle sales share in selected countries between 2016 and 2021. Um, this reflects the interests of automakers to capture electric vehicle markets share by producing new models uh, where they accelerate efforts to expand electric vehicle driving range, which is, uh, is the main important consideration for consumers. Uh, with respect to the trends in the heavy-duty uh, vehicles, registration of electric buses and heavy-duty uh, trucks increased in, in 2021 in China, Europe, and the U.S. Sales of electric buses increased by 40% over the previous year, even as the global bus market remains roughly constant. Uh, in 2021, the global electric bus stock was like six, uh, 67 K. This represents about 4% of the global fleet for buses. In the previous uh, years, China actually dominated the electric bus market and new registrations continue to increase. However, sales of electric buses since 2018 in the United States and throughout Europe have been chipping away of this dominance of the global market. Global sales for electric medium and heavy duty trucks were more than doubled over 2020 volumes, which total, with total, while total sales volume remained roughly the same level as the previous years. So what are the, the challenges for electromobility? Uh, uh, the main, actually, the main global challenge for uh, electromobility is the investment in electric vehicle charging infrastructure and network planning, uh, which, is, which must dress, uh, increase to meet ambitious zero electric vehicle targets. Uh, actually, China and Europe possesses the largest electric vehicle charging networks in the world. Their charging network supplied the largest percentage of global electric vehicle stock in 2021, around 48% in China and 33% in Europe. Uh, this graph represents uh, the ratio of electric light truck duty vehicles per charger av availability by country. As the number of electric vehicles on the road increases, the electric vehicle per charger ratio can help assess the suitability of a charging network. Uh, the sustainable, the suitable, actually the suitable number of a charger per electric vehicle depends on some factors, um, the housing stock, the population density, and the average distance traveled. So, uh, as the electric vehicle uh, market swell, access to public uh, charging will need to expand as well. Today, most electric vehicle charging uh, takes place at the uh, residences and workplaces, but consumers will increasingly expect the same services like simplicity and autonomy for electric vehicles as they do for conventional vehicles. Uh, charging infrastructure took or needs uh, to increase more than 12-fold by 2030 to support the growth of electric car markets. Uh, another global change is the electric vehicle component and material supply chain. Uh, the transformation of the automotive industry toward electrification will disrupt the entire supply chain and create a significant shift in market size for automotive components. 
and uh, as seen here, critical components for electrification such as batteries and electric drivers and for autonomous driving like light detection and ranging which are the LiDAR sensors and radar sensors, will likely mark, make up about 52% of the load market size by 2030. Components only used in, in internal combustion engine vehicles would see a significant decline to around 11% by 2030, uh, about half the size of uh, 2019 levels. Such a drastic shift will force traditional components players to adapt quickly to offset decreasing revenue uh, streams. Uh, actually, uh, there are uh, policies for um, the uh, governmental policies focused on electrifying road transport and uh, put forward target milestone to simulate emission reduction to meet net zero emissions uh, for example, China and United States. In addition, uh, so in addition to uh, the focus on the ambitious and uh, targets for zero electric vehicles and bans on internal combustion engine vehicles, government uh, triggered policy tools to accelerate the deployment of a strategic electric vehicle charging infrastructure and to secure uh, electric vehicle supply chains. Uh, all of these policies could be uh, found under the Global Electric Vehicle Policy Explorer that tracks key policies and measures the support, the deployment of electric vehicles and zero emission vehicles for light duty and heavy duty vehicles. So for, and for this, the uh, recommendations are electro electromobility is a promising solution in light of accelerating advancing Advances in battery, population, propulsion, and ITS technologies. Significance and necessity of turning on renewable energy dependent transportation through maintaining, though maintaining and adapting support for zero emission transportation. And governments should continue to support deployment of publicly, uh, publicly available charging infrastructure at least until there are enough electric vehicles on the road to, for an operator to sustain a charging network. Plans on grid expansion and ex enhancements are needed now to ensure that electric vehicles can become a resource for grid stability rather than a challenge. Thank you. So I think we don't have time for questions, uh, but Dr. Uh, Mustafa will be around for, uh, for the whole day, I think. So if anyone has a question, please uh, uh, try to approach him. Uh, so the uh, fourth expert here is uh, Ted uh, Trebinier, which is uh, 30 years of experience uh, as the director of traffic operations at uh, Washington DOT. And right? 26 years with DOT. I'll make it 30. <laughs> <laughs> and now about like uh, 12 years with uh, the NREX. NREX, yes. Yeah. So I started with the DOT in 1984. You can do the math. <laughs> <laughs> and we were not talking about connected and autonomous vehicles. And so one of the things I tell folks as I kind of approach the end of my career is just how envious I am of the folks that are starting theirs, right? Because I think we're going to see more transformation in the next 10 years as we saw in the last 40, right? And it's, and it's all beneficial, or certainly a big part of it is beneficial. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the impacts, and then I'm going to talk, I've got a couple of personal observations. So some insights from Enrix, um, and then some insights from me. And um, so first of all, um, if you haven't heard of Enrix, right, we used to be known as a traffic data company. Now it's all about informa mobility information services, right, because people don't need data, they need information. And so this is what we've been talking about today so far, right, is the forces that are going to drive change. And, and there was three mentioned um, early, but we think there's four, and we've talked a lot about the fourth, which is connections, right? So autonomous, connected, electric, and shared, the ACEs. So if Steve Marshall's in the room, he can't vote, but people shout out what year I pulled this slide from. How long have we been talking about these forces transforming? It's a shy group. Come on. So I pulled this slide from a presentation I did in 2018, right? And so I thought it'd be fun to just kind of look back 
and see a little bit where we were, right? So we talked about the benefits of the, these forces, and one is opening up the roadways, right? So there's going to be less congestion. People are going to be circling the block looking for parking, right? The cars will either know where they're going to park or they're just going to drop people off and take off, right? Um, and they're also going to um, enhance transit mobility. People with disabilities are going, to be, are going to be able to travel in cars, they're going to be able to have all these different modes accessible to them, another promise of, of the ACEs. So this is the bullet list from 2018. Where are we now? So one of the things I used to do whenever, when I would end this entire presentation on these forces and where we thought this would go is I would ask folks, so when do you think we see autonomous vehicles on the road? When does this start, right? And, and there would always be a group of hands that would go up and say, five years. We'll be there in five years. Well, well that's next year, <laughs> right? Are we going to be there? I don't think we're going to be all the way there, right? But we're certainly not going to be all the way there with autonomous. But the autonomous has started. Good start on electrification. We've seen that. And connections have gone a long ways, right? So right now, when we talk about cellular connected data, um, INRIX is processing connected data from, from over 10% of all vehicles that are on the road today, right? In a lot of communities, it's, it's quite a bit more than that. And so what can you do with that? And so I wanted to highlight just a few applications that actually have come online in the last few years since we started talking about these services becoming available. These are applications that were not actually possible four years ago because there wasn't enough data, or the data didn't have the fidelity necessary for the applications. Um, the other thing that's different about these, these applications is that these applications all have a different kind of focus in mind. Early days, it was all about understanding congestion and mitigating congestion. Now it's all about what? the environment, and safety, and equity. And so these applications are focused on those goals in mind. And there's one I wish I would have put up here that I forgot about, um, shame on me, but Al Alan's talk reminded me about this, and that is um, we're actually having an initiative and a project in several states to push dangerous slowdown alerts into the cab of heavy vehicles, right? So if anybody can see the benefit of a semi-truck rolling down a rural highway at 70 miles an hour knowing that traffic has stopped ahead, that's being done today in a number of, in a number of states. We create the message right, from our, our congestion data, push it to a provider that is providing the same service that is the heads-up display electronic logbooks um, in the commercial vehicles to tell them that there's stopped traffic ahead. Right? So the applications that I showed up on the screen First one I talk about is, is intersection data, specifically optimization of traffic signals. So that sounds a lot about mobility, and it is, it is mobility, but the real big benefit here is the environment, because a little bit of change across a lot of signals can have a significant impact on reducing greenhouse gases. How big is this opportunity? So this is something I wanted to show Again, that has that um, been revolutionized by data in the last five years. For, for a number of years, we pointed back to this pie chart um, that was built back in 2004 to, to assess the causes of congestion. And right, how much congestion is associated with recurrent congestion? How much congestion is associated with traffic signals? Again, this now has been revolutionized where there is real data across the entire United States, so you can actually map and see the causes of congestion down to the county level and also rolled up to the state level today. So this isn't something that's coming. This is something that's built, right? And so every community, every state, every county can actually go into a platform and see how much of their congestion is actually attributable to these different causes. And the one I'm really focusing on here is signals. So you can see is a significant amount of your congestion, which is, you know, congestion means wasted fuel, means um, additional greenhouse gases being produced, is being caused by traffic signals. 
how big is the opportunity? You know, again, as I said, a small change times the number of locations yields significant results. Um, and so this is significant to the point that I really tell folks, if, if you're an agency that says you care about the environment, right, and you're operating several hundred signals or more, and you don't have a program to optimize those signals, then you're talking the talk, right? Because optimizing those signals is something you can do today to make a difference um, in the environment. We, we posted up on our website this um, green signal calculator to help folks actually um, illustrate the benefits, right? So if you go out and you do a traffic signal retiming project or anything that actually increases flow at the intersection, reduces delay, you can actually go in here, slide some buttons really easily, right? You don't have to do all the fancy formulas like we've been looking at all morning, right? And come up with an, uh, an estimated amount of the benefit, right? So that you can communicate it. Because obviously, in public sector, it's really important to be able to communicate the benefits that you're doing, right? If you want the budget to do tomorrow what you're doing today, you better be able to talk about the benefits of that, right? That, I spent a big part of doing that when I was a state traffic engineer for WashDOT. So now, how do we accomplish that with data? Where does data come into this picture, right? So I mentioned the amount of data we're pulling from vehicles. Well, there's a subset of those vehicles, so it isn't the full 10%, right? There's a smaller subset of those vehicles where the GPS points coming off the embedded GPS in the vehicle being transmitted via cellular, the GPS points are less than five seconds apart. And so this is data that didn't exist, again, four years ago, five years ago, but it does exist today, and it, is, it exists nationwide. And so we can take that data now, and we can not just assess you know, the, the Google Map type of congestion levels that we've been doing for a long, long time, but we can actually assess delay of every single vehicle movement through an intersection, again, at the movement level, right? So not a link level, but by the individual movements. And we can roll that up into performance measures that traffic engineers are used to seeing. They've already learned how to use, right? Through, so through the programs that have been in place for some time with detector-based systems, Right? More and more agencies have been adopting the use of ATSPMs, right? Advanced Traffic Signal Performance Measures. Well, using connected car data, we can generate the same type of performance measures. And so now, we make available to traffic engineers at any intersection across the country the same type of data they, have, they would have as if they had full detection and connection at that signal system. So they can scan across their entire system to see which intersections are wasting energy and go out and address those intersections. Put it in a platform, right? Make it easy to use. And we don't need data, we need information. And so we take that data, process it, again, into the ATSPMs, put the ATSPMs on the back end of web services so that folks want a dashboard to show which intersections have had the delay increase the most over the previous four weeks, all they have to do is turn it on, right? It's already loaded, it's already exists, um, it's available everywhere. If you want a tool to be able to drill in and, and pick specific date ranges to do a before and after study, to assess the benefit of maybe adding a right turn lane or assess the impact of converting and adding a bicycle lane along the road and you wanna know what the impact of that is to before and after study, again, there's a, there's a tool for that. You know, that's a, that's a five-minute analysis. Um, to illustrate the, the power of the data more than anything else, you know, we have published what I believe is the, the largest traffic signal study to date, right? And we, we published it now twice, this National Traffic Signal Scorecard, where we crunch numbers for over 220,000 intersections across the United States. So anybody conducted a larger intersection study? Anybody over 220,000? Um, and then published the results and rolled that up with, with a one pager for every state. Um, and then we also have on our website, you know, an interactive map. So you can actually go in and see the intersections that we've pulled the samples from. And you can click on each one individually and, and kind of see some sample data for it and a picture of the intersection. 
Um, and again, we don't, we haven't mapped absolutely every intersection because we used open street maps to find the intersection locations. But if we, if you've got a favorite intersection and it's not on our map, go into open street maps, tell them that there's a signal there, and then it'll be in our next study. Okay, so that's signals. So now I want to talk about safety. And so I'm really excited about this one. So again, this is connected car data, but this is a partnership that we're that Enrix has undertaken with General Motors to jointly push out a solution that we call Safety View. And Safety View um, again brings data sets together um, and turns them into information from both Enrix and General Motors. And it's more than just GPS data. So this goes into the, this is data that goes into the vehicle bus, so the kinds of things that you've heard about um, when we talked about the whole connected car world and the benefits that that's going to have, right? The, the extended floating car data, so things like hard braking events, right? So pulling that data out and putting that in a platform alongside the other data sets that we're used to. We also have imported data sets beyond both of us that are essentially necessary to do both the safety and the equity analysis. So on the safety side, we have a, a way to import local collision data because there is no national standard for collision data. There is no national collision database. So if you want if you want a, um, the best possible collision database, you've got to be able to import the local agency data so we can do that. The other thing um, that we're importing is from the Census Bureau, the demographic data for ethnicity and income levels, right? So as we assess safety treatments and safety solutions in the platform, we can apply an equity lens to it as well. I'm gonna back up one thing. Um, so the, the other thing that, that we brought in, and so it's brand new from, that we've created is a vulnerable road user index. So again, the safety that we're assessing in this platform is more than anything about pedestrian and bicyclists. Because as cities go out to do safety work, that is a focus, right? Much more than in the vehicle, right? On rural roads, it's about speed. And so there's speed profiles in here and there's other risk factors. But for cities to work and think about safety, you've got to think beyond the car. And so that's the other thing that's really new to us. And so the platform, and again, I won't go into detail on this because we have whole presentations and, and you can get free demos and free trials to this if, if it really interests you. But the idea is you can go in and select different elements that you're interested in thinking about, right? And see very easily some graphical illustrations related to the risk associated with those elements um, on, a, on either a citywide view or a neighborhood view, right? So you can drill into neighborhoods as well. So this illustration is how to is a heat map essentially of vulnerable road user locations, um, along with links that show the percent of speeding traffic, right? So you can kind of think about how those two things might come together to help assess risk. So final couple slides from me on the, on thoughts going forward, right? So I know we're kind of up against time, so I'll wrap up per, pretty quick here. So these are benefits going forward and kind of some research thoughts, right? So for the researchers in the room. So the first one I want to talk about is how automated vehicles are going to increase capacity. So this was, this was a lot of discussion just a couple of years ago, but still, I think, very significant discussion today. And so I think everybody can certainly visualize how automated vehicles can travel with less headway and how that will increase the capacity of our roadways, um, especially on the freeways, right? So there's a couple things that I think we need to, to ponder on that in our research topic. So the first one is somebody put a real number on it, right? So I think we really need to think about what is this increase in capacity and we need to think about it in phases, right? So the planners of the world that are calibrating models for the future really could use a number that they could stand behind to say, okay, in this year, this is gonna be my freeway lane capacity. It's no longer too, 2,000 vehicles per lane per hour, right? It's something more than that. Um, what is that real number, okay? And then once we have that, I really think that we need to start thinking about our system, and I'm talking about now infrastructure, the number of lanes. And quit talking about kind of like the next transportation package of expansion, but the last expansion. 
because we have enough roads, right? If you think about all these transformations that we've talked about today, we have enough roads. We do have some bottlenecks, right? And we do have some freight corridors that need attention. We need to think about finding those and identifying those system-wide, right? So these, is, these are our focus areas. And then, as we're thinking about this increased capacity, one of the things we can't forget to ponder is, what's gonna happen at the off-ramps? Because I, I can, in my head, is, and again, I've been doing this a while, I can easily envision how I can double and possibly even triple capacity of a freeway lane. I haven't figured out how I'm gonna get those cars off the freeway and onto the local system, right? Now, we saw the, the graphic from the Vietnam, the, the intersection, right? It's gonna look something like that, right? So um, we're gonna we're going to have to do something really dramatic at the intersections. Um, and then there's gonna be this issue, and I think this is actually near term, right? So there's more and more cars with adaptive crews. Like, I've got one, right? My car costs the system capacity when I have it in that mode. My car is much more conservative driver than I am. And my observation is that my car, and it's a Honda CRV, and there's a lot of those, right? <laughs> is more conservative than almost all drivers. And so as more and more of these cars get out there, before we reach the point where we're increasing capacity, we're gonna lose some capacity. And I don't know if you've been on I-5 lately, that's a problem, right? We can't afford to give up capacity. So what are we gonna do about that? So I think research related to optimal algorithms for super crews that could be published open source would be a benefit. Because I also, in my mind, can easily think of an algorithm that can start increasing capacity now, but we, we need to be playing together. So final slide here, thought, and again, this is on connected vehicles and where I see the biggest bang for the buck first. And that is feeder systems into transit, right? And Seattle is a poster child for this, right? The park and ride lots here in most areas fill up by when, DOT people? Some t I was gonna say between six and seven. Pick your park and ride lot, right? They fill up between six and seven. We need feeder systems so that people don't always just have to drive to the park and ride lot, right? And these feeder systems could not just feed the park and rides, right? They could feed the rapid rides, that as well, right? So there's tremendous benefit in thinking about how we put together the convenience of an Uber app, right, with an automated vehicle. And where can automated vehicles operate safely first, right, in technology? In places that can be well mapped. Right? So if an automated vehicle is constrained to a single neighborhood that is well mapped, it, that we can deploy that much sooner than turning an automated vehicle loose on the entire world. Right? Feeder systems can do what? They can be constrained to a neighborhood that's well mapped. Right? So this, and there's pilot projects going on in this right now. This is something that I think public agencies really need to kind of put their wood behind because this is, this is the immediate wins where we can, again, help really facilitate transit um, and um, see the benefit of connected and automated vehicles first. All right, that's my two cents, thanks.